and get the um, and get the recording started. It started, and it looks as though my sharing is started. So I'm I'm presenting to everyone. Here we go. The endocrine system. Now this is kind of a concept that we have dealt with uh, all along in the um, in the semester. It is the idea of communicating messages around the body. Now we've seen the nervous system and it's very fast because within a cell it can send messages electrically and that's very, very fast. But even in the nervous system we noticed that the communication between cells was due to a place we called the synapse and a chemical messenger that we called a neurotransmitter. The neurotransmitter is really a chemical messenger between cells, and that's what we're really dealing with in the endocrine system, is the rest of the glandular tissues that communicate messages around the body. So the endocrine system consists of glands, which are, which are organs or groups of cells, tissues, whose job is to produce a secretion. These chemical messengers in the endocrine system are called hormones. And they basically will regulate many different aspects of metabolism, uh, all the way from regular daily thing like iron concentrations and blood sugar that are going on autonomically to uh, one of the things we've seen is sympathetic nerve stimulation with norepinephrine and epinephrine turning on target tissues that excite and activate the muscles, lungs, and heart for a whole body response. They're going to coordinate at all levels, the cell level, the tissue level, the organ level, and it's going to be a sustained basis. Now, we've talked about the nervous system as a fast signaling system, and that kind of leads people fast. They think of the opposite as slow. This isn't by any means slow in an absolute sense, so that a hormone dump will start to bring sometimes noticeable responses within 30 seconds, certainly within a minute. We're going to see three structural types of these chemical messengers, which we're going to call hormones. Amino acids, um, and in individual amino acids do have hormone effects. Uh, peptide hormones, which is just a string of amino acids, and they can be small. There are some that are five to seven amino acids. Some are larger. And finally, lipid derivatives, the so-called uh, steroids. So receptors are going to be necessary for these chemicals to have their effect. In the same way in the synapse, we had a postsynaptic receptor for the neurotransmitter. We're going to have receptors planted in cells and tissues all over the body. So when a particular uh, gland dumps its hormone, those places that have receptors are going to experience a change in metabolism. The idea here is intercellular communication. And we've just spent six chapters looking at this phenomenon of the synapse. Here's a neurotransmitter in the synapse stimulating the postsynaptic membrane uh, with a binding. Here are the receptors, the target tissue, the postsynaptic cell. But other methods include the release of chemicals that may move from one cell to an adjacent cell. Now, this depends on gap junctions. So this is a way of stimulating having a single uh, endocrine cell stimulating a group of cells that it is directly connected to. Paracrine communication depends on vesicles and the hormone being packaged inside those vesicles. When you stimulate this cell and it releases it, it diffuses through these intracellular spaces. So its effect is, is bigger than cells that are connected, but it is smaller than whole body, and we call this paracrine uh, secretion. Finally, there will be groups of cells, and those groups of cells release from vesicles, but the difference here is that an element of the cardiovascular system, a capillary, picks them up and basically transports them all over the body. So the uh, target tissues for these hormones will be um, 
I have a much, much broader effect. Witness norepinephrine and its effect under sympathetic stimulation. Muscles all over the body, lungs, and heart are all optimized. This particular uh, slide right here gives you a great foundation in the endocrine system. The purple uh, uh, bars show you the boxes we're going to discuss in this chapter, with the exception of this one. You'll notice here are organs for systems like cardiovascular. The thymus is part of the immune system, the endocrine system. Uh, not endocrine, but um, immune, the lymphatic system. Adipose tissue, fat regulation, the digestive tract, the urinary tract, and the reproductive tract. All of these will be discussed in A&P2. And the whole point here is that these will have more local effects. But over here, we start in the crown, the hypothalamus, pituitary, and pineal gland, all located within the skull. The hypothalamus we've described as that brain region that coordinates neural function of the central nervous system with the endocrine system. So it's the highest order of control. The master gland, the pituitary gland, is its primary target. Now, it does make, the hypothalamus, does make some things that directly affect the urinary system or directly affect the reproductive system. And we'll emphasize that next semester. But most of its hormones are hormones that control the pituitary gland. It makes gland-regulating hormones. So ACTH is adrenocorticotrophic hormone, and it regulates the adrenal gland. TSH is thyroid-stimulating hormone, and it turns on the thyroid gland and so forth. Finally, here in the back, we've talked about the pineal gland uh, in the ventricle mounted uh, up in the cerebral and diencephalon area, producing melatonin, which affects our sleep cycles. Now, right here in the neck, in the throat, there is a single block of tissue that surrounds the trachea, solid in the front, but basically open in the back. It's a kind of a C-shaped organ. The main body of this is the thyroid gland that produces T4, T3, and calcitonin. Around on the back of the thyroid gland, on the body of the thyroid gland, there are four spots of tissue. And together, they produce parathyroid hormone and constitute the parathyroid gland. So this block of tissue is kind of a composite glandular system. Now down here, the adrenal glands sit on top of the kidneys, and they do not um, uh, regulate so much the kidneys. The adrenal gland, adrenal medulla, the center, produces epinephrine and norepinephrine for sympathetic stimulation. And the adrenal cor cortex produces a number of different hormones, including cortisol, corticosteroid, aldosterone, which we're, we'll talk about for water regulation, and androgens for the reproductive system. Finally, down here, the pancreas, one that makes insulin and glucagon. Insulin, we know the name very well because a mutation of the insulin gene is what produces type 1 diabetes. Glucagon is its counterpart. If insulin transports blood sugar into the cell and has any number of other facilitating uh, functions, glucagon uh, opposes those functions. So if insulin stores glucose in the liver, glucagon breaks that insulin back out of the glycogen and releases it. So it is generally this, this top J here that we're going to be talking about in chapter 18. Hormones are not unlimited in their molecular structure. So here, amino acids, especially tyrosine and tryptophan, give rise to, uh, um, give rise to hormonal effects. The peptide hormones are either small or large. Uh, they basically range in size and include things like thyroid stimulating hormone, luteinizing hormone, luteinizing is for reproduction, and the short polypeptides like um, antidiuretic hormone and oxytocin are also peptides. You see, so think about it, the amino acid, 
has a big effect on hormonal um, uh, regulation. Finally, there are the lipids. These are the ones that diffuse into the um, uh, cell readily because they have these long hydrophobic uh, portions. They move freely in and out of cells and that penetration facilitates their action. Steroid hormones are the ones we are most familiar with. So let's take a look and uh, think about the ways hormones work. It's going to be a chemoreceptor. So the receptor is going to work just like the postsynaptic membrane receptors, where, which bound the neurotransmitters. They're going to work by binding the hormone. These are going to be specific chemical reactions. So often this is going to produce a kind of a chain response. And that, that chain response means a what I would call a biochemical cascade. There may be five or six different transformations with different enzymes that are necessary to reach the product. The first messenger is the hormone. And it may act by producing the active um, uh, uh, feature of the system, like an enzyme activator, an inhibitor, or a cofactor. The most important second messengers are cyclic AMP, and cyclic GMP, both of which are related to the ATP and energy cycles uh, that we'll study in detail next semester. And finally, our old favorite, the calcium ion. Now, calcium is our most abundant mineral, so we can always get some by tearing down bone. But its soluble uh, concentration is very small, 8.5 to 11 um, uh, micrograms per deciliter. That's a, that's a very small amount, and yet it's needed for very, very important uh, uh, metabolic processes. There's another uh, messenger in here called a G protein that is sometimes activated by hormonal action. Endocrine is autonomic, so we talk about it as an endocrine reflex, just like a neural reflex, meaning you're unconscious, your subconscious is uh, controlling this, and it can be stimulated by stimuli from anywhere. Extracellular fluids, humoral, a specific hormonal, hormonal, or a neurotransmitter if we call it neural. So there's an interaction that we've already seen when we were talking about the nervous system and we brought in the hypothalamus and the uh, um, pituitary gland. Um, these are going to always be integrated since they're both regulating uh, cell, tissue, organ, organ system, and whole body responses. Uh, the highest level of endocrine control is the hypothalamus. And the hypothalamus works really in three ways. The hypothalamus shown here, just the floor of that diencephalon, right where it splits, it's just undistinguished tissue in terms of its overall appearance. There's no lines or borders where the hypothalamus start. But the first way the hypothalamus works in the endocrine system is by what I would call direct production. Now, this is an odd and kind of interesting thing. The hypothalamus cells themselves produce the hormone, antidiuretic hormone or oxytocin. These centers of production have ducts that lead to the posterior pituitary, where they are stored for release. We will talk, ADH actually affects water balance. Oxytocin has an effect on the reproductive system. The second method, which is by far the most uh, diverse and uh, has the widest impact over the body, is that the hypothalamus secretes a regulatory hormone that's going to work right here on the anterior pituitary. Now, the anterior pituitary has different clusters, nuclei of cells separated by connective tissue. Each nucleus produces a different regulating hormone. And the main effect of the hormones from the anterior pituitary is to release a hormone that's going to stimulate another gland. So thyroid stimulating hormone, um, 
uh, and, and adrenocorticotrophic hormone and so forth. Um, the third method we've already talked about and we'll just review it briefly here and that is the control of the sympathetic output. You recall that the hypothalamus was capable of sending a message down through the nervous system, out through the chain ganglia, a collateral ganglia to the medulla of the adrenal gland, which is perched on top of the kidneys. This third type of hypothalamic action is direct, and when stimulated then, the adrenal medulla releases epinephrine and norepinephrine, and this is again sympathetic nerve stimulation for that whole body activation, maximum muscular performance supported by increased to maximum rates in the heart and lungs. So starting with the hypothalamus, remember the highest level of endocrine control completely synchronized with all the neural input, all the nerve system sensory and motor information that's going on in the body uh, at a given time. When we look at this portal system between the hypothalamus and the pituitary, now this stalk is called the infundibulum and here's the pituitary lobe itself. It's relatively small as tissues go, but you can see the different nuclei of endocrine cells, each one of them responsible for a different hormone. We also know that this pituitary hangs down in a very prominent bone marking on the sphenoid bone, the cella tersica or Turkish saddle, that groove that runs across the top of the sphenoid bone is what protects and encloses this pituitary gland in the skull. So what we see is the so-called hypophysial portal system is the ability to transport these hormones down to these capillary networks. Now this is something that is an exception behind the blood-brain barrier because whereas we're regulating all the material that's arriving in the blood vessels all around these living cells with astrocyte coatings, oxygen and nutrients don't get in without going through an astrocyte. What we see here are very porous capillaries so that if stimulation leads the hypothalamus to stimulate this group of cells and hormones are dumped, it is, they are absorbed almost uh, immediately by this dense uh, group of capillaries and conducted out by veins and immediately transported all over the body. That means anybody that's got a receptor is going to be stimulated. When we see this, uh, we, we don't want to oversimplify the idea of hormonal action. Sometimes it takes multiple steps. So what we see here on the left, the hypothalamus stimulating the anterior lobe of the pituitary, which will produce hormone 1 which will act on its target organ, an endocrine organ, which is going to release to the bloodstream, and hormone 2 will then circulate and affect the target cells. Over here, we see variations on these themes. Sometimes the stimulation feeds back. So here we're producing a, a hormone called prolactin, which stimulates the breast and the lobules in the breast to synthesize milk. And prolactin has a direct effect in the reproductive system. Uh, this prolactin also feeds back to stimulate the hypothalamic influence, PIH, uh, to, in, to reinforce this as long as the right stimulation is received. So sometimes there are multiple steps. This figure is one of those summary figures. This time I'm going to give you the overall summary first, and then I'm going to go as far as we can today through the individual systems. Here is the hypothalamus and its three levels of control, direct on the adrenal medulla, direct release through the posterior pituitary, and the, the majority influence, indirect control through regulatory hormones in the anterior pituitary. So we've already covered 
the um, stimulation of the adrenal medulla, epinephrine and norepinephrine, which stimulates uh, glucocorticoids, cortisol and corticosteroid, as part of that activation mechanism. Over here, the direct release we can deal with pretty quickly. One of the things that produces antidiuretic hormone. Now, the name kind of tells you what it does. Anti means against, and diuresis is the release of liquids. So, if ADH is present, it converts urine formation in the kidneys to retain water. It's against the release of water. The the kidneys release less water and the urine gets more concentrated. So ADH would be released under conditions of low water approaching that dehydration line. Oxytocin, the other uh, direct production hormone, is something that stimulates the reproductive organs. Uh, in males, the smooth muscle and the ductus deferens and prostate gland, which we'll really do in detail next semester. In females, it affects uterine smooth muscle, which means it's involved with labor. As oxytocin climbs, labor contractions get more intense and closer together. But oxytocin is also involved in milk letdown. Notice that I said letdown. Prolactin here actually stimulates its production, but not its release. It's oxytocin that begins that release. And then it's the continued stimulation of, nur of nursing and sensors here in the nipple that continue its production until weaning. That leaves us with this anterior pituitary job. And starting here with adrenocorticotrophic hormone, it has an effect on the cortex of the um, uh, adrenal gland, which we'll talk about in a moment. Thyroid stimulating hormone stimulates the thyroid gland. Growth hormone in the, stimulates the liver to produce these somatomedins. Somat, somatic means body cells, and it basically influences the metabolic activity of cells all over the body, and especially the big bulk tissues. So we're going to make lots of bone. We're going to make lots of muscles, and the uh, rate of cell division and cell differentiation is increased. In fact, uh, exogenous application of growth hormone to mice uh, and compared to control groups that receive everything except the growth hormone produce a control group that look like mice and a um, experimental group that, uh, with growth hormone that look more or less the size of rats. Mammary glands are stimulated by prolactin, another hormone from uh, keyed by the hypothalamus but released from the anterior pituitary. Follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone are these two, and um, they basically are released uh, from the anterior pituitary in males and in females. They basically stimulate the uh, gender-appropriate hormones, inhibin and testosterone in the males, and estrogens, progesterones, and inhibin in the females to support the reproductive cycles and reproduction. Finally, this border between the anterior and posterior is called the uh, uh, pars med medullin, and it produces MSH. That's melanocyte stimulating hormone. And uh, we do know that there's a direct connection here, although the effect in healthy adults is not really that clear to us. So that's our overview. Let's get to some of the details. Here, we're presenting a slide of the thyroid gland. Um, this shows the position of the thyroid gland as it clasps the trachea right below the larynx, right here. And it is a C-shaped organ, complete around the front, but open in the back. We're going to see these Cartilage rings are formed the same way, solid in the front, but open in the back. And the reason is this is the airway. It isn't usual, but sometimes a solid object is inhaled and it gets stuck in the airway. If you leave that back open, 
then that's fibrous tissue running up and down, but it can stretch. It can kind of open a little bit. So the Heimlich maneuver can boost that stuff right back out. The C shape of the thyroid organ basically follows that same principle. You notice that it's mounted between some pretty major blood vessels. And when you look inside an endocrine organ, you see very distinct histological reason, regions. And by that, I mean just looking at this slide right here, you can see the formation of these interstitial cells that basically surround, they, they basically are going to produce the hormones and store them in these cavities called follicles. These are then uh, prepared and ready for release uh, when needed. Thyroid hormones have a broad stimulating effect on peripheral tissue. So looking at some of the things we can definitely attribute to thyroid hormones, we kind of understand the observation. If you have a friend who has a thyroid deficiency and is taking thyroid supplementation, what you will uh, notice uh, or what they will tell you is that their main um, symptom is one of tiredness, of uh, uh, a laxity, of uh, energy. So what does thyroid hormone do? Elevates oxygen consumption and energy consumption. That's ATP. And sometimes it causes a rise in body temperature as a result of that additional uh, in children as a result of that additional activity. Heart rate and force of contraction goes up. Blood pressure goes up. Sensitivity to sympathetic stimulation increases. So if um, you have thyroid hormones present at the same time you have a sympathetic stimulation, you get more of a muscle, lung, and heart impact. The normal sensitivity of respiratory centers and its, its monitoring of oxygen and carbon dioxide is maintained. It stimulates more red blood cell formation. And as a result, would in the near term, not immediately, but in the near term, enhance oxygen delivery. Uh, it, activity in other endocrine tissues is stimulated and it accelerates the turnover rate or the chemical reactivity in bone. So a broad effect for thyroid hormones. Here's that curious thing I mentioned earlier about a composite gland. We're looking here at the posterior view of thyroid. This is its position from the back. But you notice when you remove it, the trachea has been taken out. And we basically are standing with our back to the spinal cord. Uh, I'm sorry, to the vertebral column. And right around here, we would notice the uh, these lobes, where the pointer is now, all of these uh, light flesh-colored lobes, are going to be as represented in the thyroid slide previously. But here are four spots, one, two, three, four, left and right. And there you see a very different histological arrangement. Here's that thyroid arrangement surrounding the follicles. And then there's this border with a blood vessel running right through the center of a very different assemblage of cells. And this is what we call the parathyroid hormone. The parathyroid hormone is perched on the thyroid hormone on the body. And these chief cells and oxyphil cells uh, stimulate um, some counteractivity so uh, a calcium regulating hormone is produced by the thyroid, where the pointer is now. PTH is a uh, antagonistic hormone to that produced by the parathyroid. We'll talk about that in a moment. So let's talk about it now. Homeostasis here, normal calcium levels, eight and a half to 11 milligrams. I think before I said micrograms, it's not that quite, not quite that rare but milligrams for a whole deciliter of fluid. So let's say that blood calcium is on the rise, meaning it's getting toward that 11 milligram uh, reading. What happens is that the thyroid gland produces calcitonin. Calcitonin's effect is in the kidneys, which means since calcium is high, it's going to allow the kidneys to release calcium in urine. Normally, calcium is reclaimed. 
but under the effect of calcitonin, that calcium passes out in the urine. Calcium deposition in bone is, uh, is uh, enhanced. The osteoblasts increase their activity relative to the osteoclast, and you're pulling calcium out of solution, putting it into bone. Both of those effects lower the calcium and bring it back into the homeostatic range. So let's just say you've just done that and the level of calcium gets down to near 8.5 milligram and still falling. That falling level approaching the minimum homeostatic balance causes the parathyroid glands on the back of the thyroid to secrete parathyroid hormones. Now, that produces a number of effects. One effect is in the kidneys, and it's just exactly the opposite of thyroid uh, calcitonin. It causes the kidneys to reclaim that calcium and not let any out in the urine. So this is a retention mechanism to stop the fall. Calcium in the bone is released as you suppress the osteoblasts and activate the osteoclasts, that bone that's being chewed out will uh, add soluble calcium. And a final effect here, um, calcitriol is produced as a secondary effect from this parathyroid hormone. Now, its effect is on the digestive system. It turns out that if you're eating plenty of calcium, that's step one. But as the calcium flows through the intestinal uh, uh, passageway, the lumen, next to the endothelium, there are transport enzymes necessary to absorb it. And that's what this is effect. More PTH means more calcitriol and an additional absorption of calcium from the digestive tract. So each of those contributes blood calcium and restores this homeostatic range. Now, you think about it, the body is really working pretty hard to maintain calcium levels. That homeostatic range, if you remember, um, supports the contraction of muscles. Do you remember calcium in the um, endo, uh, endoplasmic reticulum? Uh, do you remember it in the uh, reticular formation around the sarcomere? Uh, you remember calcium as a presynaptic uh, terminus right near the synapse. Calcium rushed in to cause the fuse of vesicles with neurotransmitters. So contracting a muscle, sending a nerve impulse, both require calcium. Calcium is also required for blood clotting. So the fine control is under the endocrine system. The adrenal gland perches here on top of the kidneys. Kidneys are there to remove nitrogenous waste and to uh, make urine. You see two distinct areas, the cortex going around the outer part and the medulla. This is surrounded by a capsule of kind of tough covering material, rich supply of blood vessels. So from these different zones, you can see the cortex is histologically distinct from the medulla. You can see a definite border there. Here's that capsule that encloses the entire adrenal medulla gland. We have a number of different hormones produced uh, by the uh, uh, adrenal gland. Here in the cortex, mineral corticoids primarily aldosterone, which has to do with regulating water balance in the body, primary target to the kidneys. The glucocorticoids, cortisol, hydrocortisone, corticosteroid, I think names that you have are familiar with because of their medicinal activation, uh, uh, applications. They affect most cells and they stimulate uh, release of amino acids and lipids and so forth, they basically accelerate the metabolic level. Here, androgens are also released in males. Most cells are affected. This is not important in adult men because of the role of their reproductive organs in maintaining 
testosterone levels. But this is the main source of androgens that support children and women uh, 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 tissue increase. So bone growth, muscle growth, and blood formation is actually coming from a group of cells, the zona reticularis in the cortex of the kidney. Here, the medulla we've talked about many times with its epinephrine and more norepinephrine, and what a metabolic uh, uh, activity boost it gives, sympathetic stimulation from sympathetic uh, preganglionic fibers for that whole body response and maximum physical output. Let's dodge up here to the pineal gland. We've looked at it it's in the roof of that third ventricle that we examined before, and it releases a hormone called melatonin. It's a somewhat um, mysterious, although we do use it as an uh, external medicine to affect sleep patterns. Uh, melatonin is used uh, widely as a sleep aid. But it also affects a kind of a more mysterious thing called circadian rhythms, which is a way of supporting a chemical periodic change. Um, sleep modulation is one of the things that, that responds to that. You know, if you establish a sleep pattern so that you go to bed at 10 and you get up at 6, that becomes a, 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 light, a kind of a repeating pattern. You get sleepy in the evening around 10, and you wake up uh, naturally at 6. Um, uh, this kind of pattern is one that is sometimes difficult to change. So if you all of a sudden you get hired and you have to do shift work, where you're working from midnight to 8, and you have to change your sleep pattern, sometimes it takes several days or weeks uh, to get accustomed to that. I wouldn't point out that Different individuals react in different ways. Some people seem to be more neutral to these kind of rhythms and adapt easily. Other people are very, very sensitive. The place we see these rhythms most frequently are in uh, conditions of jet lag. Now, when I fly west, I basically arrive, and if I, I, you know, I'm either earlier in the day or I have experienced an extended day when I flew to China, you know, basically, that was a trip that took uh, place all in daylight. But uh, when I arrived, it was something like 3 or 4 a.m. Um, here in St. Louis. So if I'm flying west, I stay up, I sleep, and then I get up and I'm fine. But flying back the other way, coming east, um, your body tries to sleep at times you want to be awake and vice versa. These circadian rhythms are known in chemical and hormonal control in plants. If you've ever had a plant that raises its leaf uh, in the sunlight and drops its leaves uh, at night, um, if you take some of those plants and put them in a, um, a closet, the hormonal regulation for the circadian rhythm, even in the dark, they will stand there and around dawn, they'll raise their leaves up and around uh, sundown, they'll drop their leaves down, and that will continue for several days until this chemical pattern uh, decays. So the pineal gland in humans, melatonin, sleep cycles, definitely, but other circadian rhythms. The endocrine pancreas is probably the one gland you will hear the most about because of its connection to diabetes an emerging and a fully emerged epidemic in the United States right now. This is a multiple uh, 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 hormone and enzyme gland. It has profound effects on digestion, but the primary effect we're looking with in terms of endocrine regulation is a productive insulin and its counterpart or its antagonist, glucagon. The position of the pancreas is in the retroperitoneal space in a membrane, a serous membrane that encloses it. It's a broad, flat organ, and it has these lobes as many glands do. This is the digestive tract. So this is the small intestine right outside the stomach. This first few inches is called the duodenum, and that's what attaches to the pancreas. The pancreas is going to supply 
dozens of digestive enzymes to the stream of food moving through the digestive tract. Along with that, it's going to provide the enzymes insulin and glucagon. And here's how they work. Normal blood glucose is subject to a broader variation. Look at that, 70 to 110 milligrams per deciliter. That's very different from calcium, isn't it? Which was 8.5 to 11. Well, it's higher because we're talking about blood glucose. That's the carbon fragment that's running a great deal of our ATP production. So we want to maintain it at a high level, but not too high. Um, the other thing is that blood glucose is subject to episodes of eating. So we go through a fast overnight. We wake up in the morning, we eat breakfast, we dump a whole bunch of nutrients, carbon fragments, down into our digestive tract, and a great deal of it becomes blood glucose. Now that means there's this spike following feeding, which then diminishes and evens out into this blood glucose range between meals. So how does this system work? So we eat and we experience, because of absorption and the trans, transfer, the transition of many carbon nutrients into glucose, the blood glucose level starts to rise. In the pancreas, the beta cells secrete insulin and it has multiple effects. It turns out it's the all-purpose blood glucose processor. The rate, the rate of glucose transport into target cells increases with that dose. Now, by the way, the only reason you're transporting any glucose in the first place is because uh, there was a base level of insulin present, but this new insulin causes a much more rapid uh, uh, transport into the cells. So what you're doing in the morning, you get up and you've been transporting insulin in to support this minimum level, but you basically haven't been doing full metabolism because of the lower level of insulin, of glucose circulating in the blood. With that spike of glucose from breakfast, you're going to basically feed the cells. The rates of glucose utilization and ATP generation, several steps are affected by the presence of insulin. So it accelerates the metabolism. The conversion of glucose to glycogen is occurring in the liver and in the muscles where insulin is required to polymerize glucose. The amino acid absorption and protein synthesis is also affected by um, insulin, the presence of insulin, and triglyceride synthesis in adipose tissue, so fatty acids. Now, you'll notice something here about insulin, although we focus on blood glucose because that's our index to diabetic activity. It's affecting not just the carbohydrate, it's affecting the protein, and it's affecting the fat in the body. So basically, what's happening without insulin uh, these materials can't get into the cells, so the cells are sending these messages, feed me, feed me, feed me. And blood sugar is circulating right, right across that membrane. In the intracellular spaces, the blood sugar goes sky high, the blood glucose goes high, 600, 700, 800, 900. Along with that, that's basically changing the blood into syrup, but because insulin isn't present, it can't get into the cells. Blood glucose levels... Uh, when, when insulin is present and all of these factors are operating, the blood glucose decreases down toward its minimum level. Now, what if it pushes its minimum level? Blood glucose levels decrease. So right after you feed the first half hour, the first hour, maybe the first hour and a half, you're undergoing absorption, but then pretty much you've absorbed all the food value from that meal and you're transporting and processing other materials in your digestive tract, and you start to use up the, the glucose in the blood. It starts to approach this minimum level. As it dips down, the alpha cells secrete glucagon. Glucagon is antagonistic to insulin. 
So what it does in the liver is most important, but skeletal muscle, if you're exercising, also has glycogen. Glucagon breaks the glycogen back to glucose and puts it in the bloodstream for general circulation. Also, glucagon starts taking fat to fatty acids in the adipose tissue. It breaks down fat in order to release carbon fragments that can support ATP production. And it also stimulates the synthesis and release of glucose by the liver. So all of these things are going to arrest the fall of glucose and stabilize it within this range. So a good competent gene for insulin production causes you to be constantly adapting to the interaction between blood glucose levels and your feeding episodes during the day. I also want to throw in a reminder here. There's a lot of different ways of looking at what a human life is, but we're all aware of the idea that some organs, some appendages could be completely removed and uh, uh, following that, uh, uh, that uh, removal, you're still healthy and live a long life. Um, blood glucose is the only nutrient that supports the brain and the central nervous system. So this insulin uh, mechanism and glucagon mechanism is constantly at work maintaining that blood glucose level for the brain, which is essentially your, um, your identity. So uh, diabetes mellitus is something you'll encounter in your career, and this is the typical profile, uh, one that tends toward obesity and basically uh, predicts things like retinal damage, uh, optical neuropathy, kidney degeneration from dealing with that blood glucose level. The kidneys actually do something that in a healthy person do, does not occur. They spill sugar. Peripheral nerve problems, especially in the extremities of the appendages, fingers and toes, related to this syrupy blood sugar and the uh, 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 wild fluctuations in blood sugar uh, from high to low uh, produces circulatory problems that are most uh, pro pronounced uh, in the digits. So endocrine function of the kidneys includes a number of uh, particular uh, hormones. Renin is a cascade that affects water retention. And I, when I say a cascade, you'll notice here it is, renin is released. Erythropoietin is one that affects red blood cell production. Renin starts this ca cascade. Angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2, uh, stimulating the secretion of ADH by the hypothalamus posterior pituitary, and aldosterone is produced. It also makes you thirsty. So when your blood pressure falls and renin is released, it produces all these effects short term. And frankly, just drinking a couple of liters of water can raise your blood pressure and volume. While the erythropoietin is supporting the increase of red blood cell production in your blood and restoring the normal blood pressure and balance. Now, steroids are something that are in the news. Steroids are hormones that increase your physical performance and physical development. They are illegal in most professional sports and something that we will um, see as uh, a continued, uh, basically, challenge to uh, the regulating and, and uh, rule-making organizations of baseball, football, and so forth. They give you an edge. The general adaptation syndrome, I'm just going to have to do quickly, basically uh, talks about the uh, decline of the body, and it's especially uh, noticeable in young children. This shows a child in the exhaustion phase uh, from the depletion and virtual exhaustion of internal body reserves, and uh, that relates to some of the endocrine functions and eventually leads to the breakdown and uh, failure of certain organs. So we did get through the endocrine system. And I'm going to stop the recording check.
and check the um, attendance on my way 